So when you look at the style of people's clothing, you can see there's this great group up here on the top where there's uh, a couple of young men and then all these young ladies, and they're all dressed very well. And you can see they're you know, very full coat sleeves of the you know, 1860s period there, and it's all very well trimmed, and they're looking very good. And you know, how about the fit of the clothing? Again, that's what I said earlier, look at the fit of the clothing. How is this fitting on the person? And if you're looking at it from a living history standpoint, well, when I go and get myself a reproduction music clothing, what should I look for as to how it fits on me? Uh, the construction details, you know, what do you see about how it's made? What kind of fabrics are being used? Is it wool? Is it cotton? Um, you know, that's, I mean, some things you're never going to be able to see. And it's very hard. I mean, I'm not going to be able to look at this image and be able to tell if it's machine sewn or hand sewn. But if you still look at it, see the fit, see the style of the sleeves, see the way it's put together. Um, and sometimes you just have to kind of guess. Say, well, it looks like that, maybe the way it is. And uh, then the color is always the one that's the biggest. Because like I said before, the cologne process did not capture color. So is it red? Is it blue? And that's, I mean, it's one of those things you always feel the, 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 impulse, the, the impulse to do is say, oh, well, this guy's wearing a gray suit. You don't know that, or a light colored, you know, this woman's wearing a light colored dress. You don't know that's a light colored dress. It could have been dark blue, it could have been some dark green, but the way it's colloquial is, is light. So you don't know, you can't always say that. I mean, even, you know, we have, you know, for direct comparison, we have this image of a um, Knight Templar here, and he's wearing a coat, identical to this one, and it looks great. It's just the way the colloquial works. It, he would have been wearing a black coat identical to that one, but it's come out as this lighter shade of gray. So it's really hard to say what color it is. Yeah. Yes? The hairdos also say something. Oh, yeah, the hair, absolutely. It's like the, the longer hair on the young lady, the less mm -hmm. it would mean she's an unmarried woman. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. uh, yeah that's, and that's another thing, too. And that's one thing you look at, especially with the Victorian society. There was a lot of it with clothing. I mean, nowadays, you know, clothing is very, you know, we've got the mass produced clothing. It's very democratic. You know, you can't really tell a millionaire just by the way they're dressed most of the time on the street. But again, the other thing, too, is people normally wear their best for 19th century photographs, or they wear whatever they have. And so what can their clothing, what can their, their, their hairstyles tell you about who they are? And also it can tell you about people in different age groups and different social economic groups. Um, in the Victorian period, young women tend to get, you know, women tended to dress their age and to dress according to the age in which they were raised. And so older women tend to be very conservative. You can see that in images. I mean, you know, in the 1840s, you can see older women that are still dressing like it's the 1830s. In the, you know, that was in the Figuera times when the Amortites and tin tacks are coming in and start seeing older women are still dressing like it's the 1850s and 1840s. And this is in the 1860s, 1870s. And so you kind of see this sort of backward. The younger women tend to be more fashion forward. And the same for young men as well. They tend to be wearing newer fashions. They tend to be wearing things that the older people wouldn't dare do just because it wasn't seemly. And um, so you can often tell, you know, just by looking at the way a person is dressed, and also by their own age, as you see, do they look young, do they look older, you can start dating the image fairly accurately. And um, what's interesting is that although you know images of people of color are more rare, you do see pictures of African Americans, you do see pictures of you know Asian individuals. You know again these tin types, daguerreotypes, they're fairly rare, but you do see them, and you see them from all different walks of life. And that's what you have to look at: is this person a servant? Is this person a business person? You know, you know for females, because females are often restricted to be wives and mothers. Or is this a you know the mother of? Uh, or the wife of a prominent businessman, or the wife of a laborer. And you can see down there in the lower right, you can have an image of a woman with a broom, who's obviously some sort of maid or servant. So, you know, that's one of those things. What can they say about them? And one thing you know is your occupational images. I think that's next. Oh, we've got location. We're going to get to occupational images. Now, the location image, the outdoors versus the studio. Um, and again, the light, I mean, has it been too much light coming in, or is it too little? And what does the light say about the location and the exposure process? You can see this image of the guy in the top hat here, a very crisp, very clear image. Um, it was obviously done just right, the optimal conditions with just the right amount of sunlight. The image in the bottom here, which didn't even really turn up, the top one we do not have in the store, the bottom one we do have in the store, it's actually in a case over there. It's the only outdoor, or the only street scene we have on one of these early photographic processes, and it shows a wagon loaded with lumber on a street center. We don't know where. But obviously the day that picture was taken, it was either early in the day or late in the day, or the sun just wasn't that bright because it was cloudy, because it's a very dark image. The, uh, it just does not pop out. And that's the reason why. It's just because there was not enough sunlight, or the photographer just didn't time it enough and didn't do a long enough exposure. And that's one of the things, taking, I mean, anybody will tell you, taking pictures of animals will just break your heart. And it was especially bad in the 19th century because you had very long, you had relatively long exposure times. 
up in several seconds. And you know, training an animal to stand still. So if you look at pictures, it's also true with small children. If you look at pictures of small children and animals, you see there's blurriness, and that's because they were moving. Because you were supposed to stay absolutely stock still when these pictures were taken. And often you'll see in the background, uh, if it's a full-length picture, you'll see part of a stand, which would come up in a little neck bite, so it holds you there. And sometimes you'll actually see part of the stand popping out behind the image, and you're supposed to hold you there, so you can just maintain your posture. And if the photographer is very good, he'd go off, develop the image, and you just kind of stand there. And if it didn't come out, he'd come back and say, I'm sorry, it didn't come out, we'll take another one. And um, so, you know, it was little thing where you didn't have to hold your costume. That's the reason why I didn't smile, too, because who can smile for a 30 second straight? So we just kind of, just kind of stand there in a relaxed but steady pose and take your image. And so I listened to, you know, think of the street scene. And, you know, I, the guy who was driving the line probably didn't want to sit there forever. So you can see the time where maybe he rushed it, he may not have gotten enough of an exposure. So, you know, that's, that's kind of how it works. Next. And then the photographer's props. Uh, one thing to say about the, the, the sitter. And um, again, some of these things, um, the, the image there that's in the lower, that's one we picked up. It's kind of dark. But it shows a couple guys are really having fun. They've got guns. They're kind of pointing them out cavalierly into the air. That's later. That's later 1800s. That's when people are really beginning to have fun with the camera. But we got a wacky uh, image of a, a gentleman from Germany. I think it's here, Lugendorf, with a pencil on the bottom of the thing. It also says 1872. But he's got some great high boot earnings, great little boots there, and his trousers, and his little flouncy neckerchief. And he's got this great clock in the background there. Oh, and, chair. yeah, chair. a fantastic chair. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know. I can't even tell And then we also have this other gentleman here who's kind of sitting across the chair down there at the bottom with his top hat sitting behind him on the table. And, uh, you know, it's kind of one of those things where there's a certain amount of license, a certain amount of creativity. But uh, what does it tell you about the photographer and the photographer's studio? Now, sometimes it can be occupational. Now, that guy with a clock, he could be a clock maker, but we don't really know for sure. I mean, it may have just been something that the photographer would like to have in the studio. And sometimes, you know, they need backdrops as well. And sometimes not just backdrops, but architectural elements. Uh, these two, this double tin type we have here with the groups of children, they're kind of leaning on this classic, broken piece of statuary there, and sort of this painted backdrop in the back that looks like a Greek or Roman temple. And those are very popular. Classic scenes are very popular. Sometimes we even see scenes that are made up to look like it's outdoors. You'll see someone leaning on what looks like a split rail fence, and then there'll be a backdrop behind them that looks this painted to look like a forest. We have the one with the three guys in the bathing suits with a oh. boat and a yeah, lighthouse. Yeah, one of our, our famous interviews here. So this is an example of a, a picture of a backdrop here. So again, it tells you, especially that's one of those things you start seeing really in the later 1800s, people really start having fun with the camera. Um, you know, what's going on there? And uh, a lot would tell you, I mean, the pictures, you know, like the guys with the gun. I mean, obviously they're buddies, they're out there having fun. Um, you know, you'll often see things that, you know, it's some interesting moments after that film. Now, the doctor's back marks, again, often these things would have a back mark on them. And, um, it's one of the best ways to date and identify, especially where a photograph is from. And uh, is the <laughs> back mark situated in a horizontal fashion or vertical fashion? Is it, you know, are there other identifying marks or ghosts? Sometimes if pictures have been kept in a box, you know, or you know, an album where they've been up against each other, sometimes the image in the back will actually transfer. So you'll actually see a ghost of an image on the back of a card. We've seen a couple of those, which are kind of fun. And um, it'll tell you where it was struck. Um, you can see what city this person is working in, or you know, is it the United States or Europe, or, or you know, where is it? And uh, one of the things that really gives it away for when you're it are the revenue stamps. And you can see an example, that one's been blown up quite a bit there. But oftentimes, um, during the Civil War, it's one of the ways we paid for the Civil War, we actually had revenue stamps. So for all official documents, playing cards, you know, anything you need to get notarized, anything like that, we have to have a stamp on them. 